I'm going to I'm going to talk about policy and science, a topic I've been really interested in for 35 years. Um, I am now the CEO of the Sierra Fund, and it's our mission to try to increase and organize public and private investment in protecting the natural resources and the communities of the Sierra Nevada. And we do this in three different ways. One is we actually have donors that give, uh, that give us funds and we, we grant those funds and we have a donor advised fund program and we also do uh, sponsorships under our philanthropic program for uh, fiscal organizations. And in this way we have spent millions and millions of dollars we've given away or raised and given away millions of dollars in the Sierra over the last 10 years. Um, we also uh, advocate in the capital, as we mentioned, um, and I spend a lot of time down there uh, trying to bring the voice of the Sierra into a building which has 115 people that do not represent the Sierra, and five that do. Uh, and we have a strategic campaign to address the impacts of legacy mining that I'm going to be using as my case study here as I talk about science and politics, the odd couple. I'm married to a geophysics professor at Chico State, and that's a portrait of him. <laughs> and that's, of course, me. <laughs> it's all about that base. Um, an inconvenient truth. Uh, I really believe that folks think that the democracy would work best if we based public policy on actual information. Now, this is a belief system of my own. I also just heard uh, Vern say this. Um, I th I'm thinking probably most scientists think this also. Um, but. This isn't exactly how it really happens. There are a lot of obstacles. Vern was going into them, um, obscuring data, no information, too much information, information's wrong, um, or, oh. Oh. So, obstacle number one. There's no information at all. So years ago, when I started to work um, in California on issues around uh, toxics in rural areas, people all believed, as an absolute fact, that mercury that had been used in gold mining um, was completely gone. It had all washed away 100 years ago. For those of you don't, who don't know, 160 years ago, every single tree in the Sierra was cut down to timber the mines and build the towns of the east and west gold strikes. Every stream of any size was dammed, and thousands of miles of ditches were dug to convey that water down to hydraulic mining uh, operations where they hydraulically fractured above ground mountains searching for gold. A mountain of rubble rolled down the Yuba River and all of the rivers where hydraulic mining was happening. It filled one third of the San Francisco Bay. It became so mucky that you couldn't get from the city to Sacramento to get the gold. So they got out and started to dredge the material and pull it to the side also, of course, mining it as they dredged it. This is the levee and channel system that forms the delta of California. The ecological footprint of mining goes from our even aged managed forests, which were ruined, to the debt ditches, which serve the towns, farms, and ranches of the, the Sierra and are vital to all of us, but we're, are falling apart because they were not engineered to last beyond a short term capacity. Of course, the delta itself, an artifact of mining, not a natural system. So, case study. People said, oh, all the mercury's being held up, uh, you know, held back by the dams, et cetera. That's just not true. And we went set out as the Sierra Fund to work with scientists to establish that, in fact, 96% of the fresh mercury hit, hitting the delta comes from where we are. So people used to say, there's no evidence that the mercury from the Sierra is getting to the delta. Well, you could have just stopped that sentence after, there's no evidence. So that's the first thing. No evidence. Oh, there's no evidence of a problem. Number two. You get evidence and then everybody starts to pile up giant studies of science and competing scientists. My scientists compete with your scientists, we just need one more study. Sometimes this ends up with conflicting guidelines. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has a much more relaxed standard for mercury exposure in fish than does the Environmental Protection Agency. A totally different standard on what's safe. Because the scientists just look at different data. Number three. Information denial. Well, your scientists are just wrong. They're influenced by environmentalists. Like, global climate change is a conspiracy of the environmental community with all of the world scientists together. Um, suction dredge miners would have us believe that suction dredging, which is where you take a vacuum and you vacuum up the bottom of a creek looking for gold, is actually good for the creek. There's not a shred of data proving this, but they walk into the capital and say it, don't they? Obstacle number four, the people that don't believe the Earth is round. 
This includes, sadly, some members of Congress don't believe in science. Also, um, Boko Haram doesn't believe the earth is round. Or that women should think. Ensure, so the Sierra Fund's model is we want to see science lead, I mean, in, in form, but we want the community affected by the science to actually lead the policy discussion. Scientists need to advise the policy conversation. The community affected by the scientists need to lead the, the policy discussion. We think you need good science. It needs to be understandable. It needs to be available in a, in, in, in a timely fashion. And when push comes to shove, the scientists have to simply go talk to the policymakers. You just got to go do it. I have to give this, prep, this speech because I work with a lot of scientists. And that's just not what they want to do. They just don't want to go into the Capitol and talk to political people. So what the Sierra Fund has developed over many years is a strategy of data collection, pilot projects that help us understand what's actually happening on the ground. Maybe there's some solutions we can employ. And then when we think we know what we're talking about, we go in and do policy action. We've been working on mining for 10 years and we've sponsored one bill. We didn't read about it in the newspaper and immediately introduce five pieces of legislation and then make everybody in the Capitol make a take a commitment test vote on that idea that they had over coffee last week. I'm telling you, both teams do this, manipulate information, or just as Burns said, oh, this is too urgent for us to actually study and figure out. So Sierra Fund's been studying, I'll just give you one quick case study of something we've done using science to influence public policy. We learned that most of the mercury was still being held, or at least millions of pounds are still being held up behind the dams um, in the high Sierra as elemental mercury. And that was learned before the Sierra Fund became involved in this. Actually, we learned that when, and when I was on the Board of Supervisors and we were evaluating at least the state was evaluating the takedown of a dam. This is, that's represents the Englebright Dam. To remove it, to restore fish, fish passage, we learned at that time by the USGS scientists who actually came to the meeting, and they said, this stuff is loaded with mercury. You can't take that dam down. It'll just flow out into the delta. Then everybody said, oh, thank God the dams are there. They're holding everything back. Those of us that would like to see fish passage restored on the Yuba River aren't super happy with that interpretation of things, but you know, maybe it was the right science and we needed to accept it. But we began to learn that there was this other source of mercury, it's these upland sources, like this is a representation of a hydraulic mine, yeah, Jay, I'm gonna get to state parks in just a second. Um, we know that some of these are still loaded with mercury, they're just hot with mercury, and we need to set out to try to figure out what can we do 96% of the mercury hitting the, from the, hitting the bay is coming from upland uh, mines, gold and mercury mines, some on the coast, most on the Sierra side. Uh, what can we do to clean this up? So we started to work on a case study with Malakoff Digging State Historic Park, who have been absolutely fabulous partners. State parks um, either acquired um, for free or were given or bought a number of parks which were mining parks. They're now they're the mining parks of, this, of the uh, Empire Mine, Malakoff Digging State Historic Park. Um, there's a, a few of these. Um, and in the olden days, this is the hydraulic fracturing that was happening. They took a mountain, they destroyed it, and sluiced it through tunnels. This is what it looks like now. It looks like uh, Bryce Canyon. When the stuff flows out of the pit now, in, in that, that it goes into the Humbug Creek, and the Humbug Creek hits the Yuba River. Here's the Humbug Creek hitting. Here's the Yuba River. It turns it into Thai iced tea. Every time it rains, state parks have to pay the state water board a, a, a discharger's fee because they're sending so much sediment into the river. But nobody really knew that that was mercury. Then USGS went out and did research, and they discovered that that mercury, that, that color of water that you see all the time up where I am, up in, how many of you have ever been to the Yuba River? Okay, I fell in love with it when I was eight. That's why I'm standing here. Um, <clears throat> every time it rains, that's what our rivers look like. Turns out that is a clay particle going down the river, and it's got a mercury particle attached to it. And this is how the mercury is leaving where we live, flowing over those reservoirs, and going down into the delta where it's settling in the wetlands and settling in the bay. And it's, it, it's gonna happen according to Dr. Michael Singer from US, uh, UC Santa Barbara and USGS Collaborative Project. It's gonna happen for 10,000 years. This bioaccumulative biotoxin that, that uh, is 
biomagnifies in the landscape. I imagine you're all scientists and you understand what I'm saying when I say it biomagnifies and it bioaccumulates and it attacks that which makes us human, our ability to think, our ability to stand in balance, the nimbleness of our fingers. So, one thing that happened, we demonstrated that this is a bad thing to do. You don't really want to be mobilizing mercury, flowering it, all of these things. And that data was used to help the state legislature make the decision to ban section dredge mining until we can figure out a way to do it safely. So, policy impact. The USGS demonstrates this thing about silt and clays. They come and come to meetings with the Sierra Fund. We go down and talk to the legislature, and then, then uh, assembly member now, Congressman Jerry Huffman, introduced a bill to do a moratorium on section dredge mining. I am very sorry to tell you that a court in San Bernardino last Monday, six days ago, has overturned the moratorium. On federal land only, it's very scary. I was telling her and I drove three hours each way to come talk to you guys today, because I really, really want the Native Plant Society to help us ban this technology. Okay, that's my agenda, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> the Sierra Fund has found that it's very really helpful to treat the members of the legislature like human beings, and so we have a fabulous human being, he's right there, that's Brian Dolly, he's behind everybody. He's our assembly member, a Republican, um, represents uh, most of the Sierra, and he takes people out on tours to show them his district. And you know what, he goes to their district too. Here I am, I'm actually the one taking the picture so you can't see me. This is 11 members of the state legislature. Ooh, who's that right there? That's Mr. Cork, he's gonna be speaking next. This is Chair of Agriculture, at that time Chair of Natural Resources, uh, Chair of Senate Natural Resources, Chair of Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee, blah, 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 blah. These are very important, powerful people out at Oroville Dam last February to see what the drought looked like. Sierra Fund took them. So that's what I think you have to do. You can't just Go to the legislature and throw a problem at them. We're all going to die. You actually have to define a scientific research agenda and you have to go out and do the research. I know a lot of folks that are scientists that you can't walk into their office. Well, my office, you can't walk into sometimes. It's got rubber boats, fishing equipment. We've got people out catching fish. We've done a whole lot of research I haven't talked to you about here about how the public is exposed through fish consumption and through recreating on public lands. Many of you may not be aware that we have, not only have state parks acquired a number of these abandoned mines, legacy mines, but so have a lot of land trusts, open space districts. They've acquired these properties mostly without assessing them first, not aware that they're covered. Every mine site is, has physical hazards. Every mine site does. We're sending the public out onto an unassessed piece of property that could have addicts and chefs, terribly dangerous, school children prancing about, and sometimes it looks like a beautiful cliff and a lovely pond. That's a hydraulic mining scarp. That's a plug tunnel. It's contaminated with mercury. Nobody should eat a thing out of that pond. In no way are these assessed before they're brought into public ownership or into these public opportunities. And in fact, there has been active resistance to doing it because people say, oh, you're going to drive down the price of the property. I mean, you're paying full price for a completely contaminated mine site? Really? I talked to the head of the Wildlife Conservation Board about this, and he said, he said, well, what kind of assessment do you require? He says, well, if it's not Long Beach or Martinez, well, not much. No. And I said, Nevada City is the Long Beach of 1895. Every single tree was cut down. Every single stream was damped. They left behind millions of pounds of mercury in the watershed. We're the Long Beach of 1895, and no one seems to be aware. So, I am very interested in using science to expose this problem, which is fundamental to the state of California. Our founding birthright as a state was like gold mining. And of course, what was really the very first thing we did when we got here? What did we really do? We killed all the people. Or they, they ran away through the woods, or they died of disease, or they were enslaved. That's probably the hardest uh, legacy issue for us to all understand and think about how to move forward. So Sierra Fund, in all of the work we do, works with tribal people in our area. Two representatives of tribes sit on our board of directors. We have an understanding that while we may understand the science and the red tape that needs to be cut, they have an understanding of how to manage a fishery for, let's say, 10,000 years off the coast of California without wrecking it. We've done a pretty good job of wrecking it in just 160 years. So I truly believe that it's not theoretical to me 
that the community leads and the community where I live is the tribal people and the rest of us suckers that ended up moving there because we fell in love with the place. So we're all united to say where we live and we understand that you're sitting on top of it right here. San Jose's uh, was the center of where Mercury was mined. The New Almaden mine is continuing to contaminate the San Francisco Bay. And this is an issue that needs the attention of plant scientists. You guys can help us compost these sites and stabilize them. Thank you.